Welcome everybody to Self Storage Income. Today we have a very special treat. We have Paul Moore with us. Many of you have seen his videos he's made on self storage online with bigger pockets, maybe read some of his books. And actually we'll, we'll get we'll get into Paul's Paul's history here in a minute. That's where I want to start out. We got to start out right here with this book because Paul Moore wrote the book on the perfect investment. The perfect real estate and it wasn't self storage. So he, he wrote on multifamily and how it's the perfect investment. So we're, we got Paul Moore here and we're just going to immediately jump into this. You wrote a book called the perfect investment on self on uh, not on self storage. And now that's what you do. All you're doing is self storage. Talk to me about this. What, what switch, what changed? That was a very humble title. Don't you think? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, my wife, I, I was a, I, I was a serial entrepreneur and I thought that that was a good thing, bad idea. And, um, <laughs> I, uh, I was going to put it on my business card. And, um, anyway, I, um, realized that jumping around to a whole lot of different things was a bad idea. And it meant I was constantly in startup mode and the most successful people in the world have done one thing really well for decades. And so I was really trying to get down to that one thing. And, um, in 2011, we built a ground up multifamily, we sold it, we operated it and sold it successfully. And I went back in in 2014 and said, Okay, this is all I want to do the rest of my life. I told my wife that. And um, <clears throat> anyway, multifamily, I came to the conclusion, AJ, that uh, multifamily was uh, a perfect investment. It had incredible demographics, it's got baby boomers going to, uh, you know, starting to rent at record numbers. It's got millennials renting more than buying. It's got Gen Z now who have, of course, we don't know where they'll end up. That's the younger generation, but they're, you know, 85% renters at this point, I think. And then you've got immigrants who are playing an increasing role in the demographic landscape, and they rent more often and for longer than any other group. On top of all that, you've got the mess that the federal government made in the mid 90s when they decided everybody who could fog a mirror should own a home. And of course, they mandated banks and mortgage companies to give mortgages to people who really probably weren't the best fit for a mortgage. And uh, the, you know, the um, home ownership rate went up from 63% to 69.2% in the next decade. In 2005, it peaked, and then it dropped for the next decade to 2015, back to 63%. Well, every 1% drop meant a million new renters coming into the renter pool. And of course, there weren't a whole lot of multifamily or anything being built in those early years of the recession, AJ. So there became a great supply and demand imbalance. And then with the demographics groups, I mentioned the four groups a minute ago, you're able to look out for many years and see that multifamily <clears throat> is a great balance of risk and return. In fact, the Freddie Mac mortgage, uh, you know, loans for uh, multifamily only had a 0.4% default rate at, at their height. And of course, we know that uh, Freddie Mac uh, single family loans were 10 times that at 4%. And local and regional banks had, you know, double that at eight or 10% in some cases. And so multifamily, you know, really does look great. And it looks like the perfect investment. The perfect investment's no longer perfect, however, when everybody believes it. And I guess everybody read my, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <clears throat> Seriously, multifamily became so popular that it made it impossible for uh, people to get good deals at this point. And so people are scrambling, they're overpaying. AJ, I was at a conference not that long ago where a very famous multifamily syndicator said, hey, it's okay to overpay for multifamily, just get in. Well, that's the exact opposite of the thinking of great investors like Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger and others who you know, would say, be fearful when others are greedy. Mm -hmm. And so we got to the point after banging our head against the wall for like four years where we said, okay, we've got to do something different. And so I began to look at self-storage and mobile home parks. And AJ, I was shocked, happily shocked, at the number of uh, self-storage 
facilities that are owned by independent operators and mom and pops. You know that there's 53,000 self-storage facilities in the U.S., maybe up to 54 this year. And um, that's the same number as Subway, uh, Starbucks, and McDonald's combined. But 76%, according to a recent survey, are owned by independents, and a very large number of those are mom and pops. Now, mom and pops don't know how to ring the value out. They basically have the attitude like Kevin Costner, if we build it, they will come. And um, <laughs> yes, they come do. they did for many, many years. But now these people are, you know, they're getting older and they don't have the desire or the resources or the knowledge to uh, upgrade these facilities to maximize their value. Some of them are in the path of growth and it makes for a great situation. I've talked a long time. I'll take a breath now, but um, yeah, that's the beginning of why we start into self-storage. And there's about a dozen more reasons we can get into if you want to. You know, it's interesting. Your path follows, I think, a lot of people's path into this asset class. Um, and there seems, at least for us, and we've, you know, we've been in self-storage since early 2000 through the um, recession, and everything else. It, it seems like there's still so much more runway to go. If you're looking at just um, acquisition uh, capabilities. And even though certain markets, I believe, are overbuilt, things like that, the long-term outlook for self-storage for us is just incredible because we think we will still have buys. And that's the difference. Like, you know, it, it, apartment buildings may be great for the next 10 years, but if you can't buy one at a great price, it doesn't matter. That's and exactly right. And so for us, the opportunities in self-storage, and correct me, you are the expert because it is the perfect investment. Isn't apartment buildings inverse? Isn't it like 80% of apartment buildings are institutional based or ba based by more expert operators or AJ, a large portion? AJ, 93% of apartments over 50 units are owned by corporations. And in general, the value's already been wrung out of them. Yep, exactly. And for us that aren't, you know, I mean, listen, the people that play in apartment buildings and the funds that I have, which I have a lot of uh, friends and colleagues that do that, they're very good. Their buying power is astronomical. Um, they are putting to work hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and they have massive infrastructure. Most of them had gone to school for years and years upon this at Harvard or wherever, these, you know, Ivy League schools, they're coming out of this, they're armed with, you know, that, that stamp of approval, investors are flocking to them, there seems like there's no end to the money, and for me, that's not me, that, you know, I wasn't like you, I was an entrepreneur, um, I was uh, diversifying, I want to scale, but I don't got $200 million to put to work, but in self-storage, I don't need it. And I don't need that to get great returns and to also, I don't need it to compete with the REITs. In fact, lots of my properties, I am competing with some um, REITs too, and I'm not anywhere close to them size and we get them. Right. So yeah. it's a great, I, I, I love what you, you know, kind of you placed in getting into the market or two, if you are in the market wanting to scale and, uh, you know, really grow your portfolio, it, it's, it's a fantastic, uh, asset class to do that in. And so how long have you been in storage? Uh, about two years now. Okay. And how many deals have you done? So AJ, our specific, I mean, we kind of felt that our, we, when we looked hard at this and we found out all the ways to make money on paper, which we can get into, um, I realized I didn't have a team who had survived or thrived through the great recession like you do. I didn't have a track record. I had a paper or a book knowledge of how to do this. And again, uh, I, as you know, we both study Warren Buffett. I, I felt like we were near the top of the cycle. So acting appropriately at this point, point in the market cycle looks like me not trying to assemble a team and start buying right now. I decided it would be better for us to find best in class operators and invest heavily with them. Operators who had tremendous uh, acquisition pipelines and who knew how to operate and who had a pool of REIT or institutional buyers on the other end. And so we spent most of the last two years uh, interviewing these great operators and uh, 
in negotiating premiums with them when we invest with them. And then what we're doing is we're giving investors a front door to self storage investing by basically we've set up a fund and we've allowed investors to invest with us. And then we place their money with the best in class operators and deals across the country. Yeah, that's now. So you are taking these funds, you're picking these people. Do you have a criteria when you're looking for not just operators? Like, what do you look for in self storage? The self storage, is, as you know, and I know, is it's becoming an even bigger world as far as the diverse nature of the asset class, the um, how people view it. Um, there's all of a sudden now we have spinoffs that are doing everything from valet. When you look at it and when you're working with the operators, what are you looking for to find value? So we are looking, we have about a 25 point checklist of what we're looking for in an operator. And we want them to, you know, have already been in business before the great recession, have a real W2 team of people, not just an independent consortium of friends, you know, operating here and there. Mm -hmm. we, 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 of course we do background checks and criminal checks and reference checks. We want to see how they talk about and treat their investors, employees, spouses with the waiter, et cetera. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we, we go on some on gut feel, uh, we check their facts. We, you know, we, we, you know, they say, they tell us this, well, we go check. And so, um, that's as far as the operator goes. And of course, as far as the assets themselves, you're very aware of the criteria for that, but just to kind of go over four or five real quick, one would be we want them to be hopefully far less than seven square feet, which is we believe about the national average, seven square feet of storage in a three or four mile radius typically, or if it's an urban area, you know, one mile radius uh, per person, that's one. Second, we want it to be on a very highly traveled road. Third, we obviously want it to be highly visible on that road. Uh, fourth, we want uh, it to be in a, it doesn't have to be a wealthy area, but a generally higher than average income uh, demographic in the area. Those are some of the criteria we're looking for. Another one that's harder to get your hands on um, is we want there to be barriers to entry. For example, we recently invested in a ground up self storage in um, uh, a town near Minneapolis. And this town already made a rule that said you can't build any more self storage except in industrial parks. Well, this a project was already approved before that and it's right on Ramsey Boulevard in Ramsey, Minnesota, right on the main road. So it's, you know, I mean, it's right in the middle of a whole bunch of multifamily and single family developments. It's perfect. And so we, and it has only two square feet of self storage, I believe one and a half, maybe even for climate controlled within a three mile radius. So in every way, <laughs> some of my markets have 15 square feet. So that's a, <laughs> Oh, I've heard about Boise. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, that's but at, at any rate, that's, that's what we're looking for. Yeah, that's no, I, I, I love that. That's a great frame of reference. So um, what is your comfort level? So you, you talk about, do you have a preference on the um, type as in, do you, do you focus on saying, we just want to focus on drive up, um, outdoor, or are you looking for a diverse mix? Do you want indoor, outdoor? Is that even something you, you look at at what you're trying to provide? Or is it pure just what the market needs? Well, I mean, we, we would look at what the, purely what the market needs. I think here's a, here's a funny thing. So I get investors on the phone almost at for sure more than weekly, but almost daily who say, okay, what geographies are you focused on? And I say, well, honestly, I'm following the Buffett strategy again. You know, Warren Buffett made a decision to spend billions of dollars on a 15 minute phone call to acquire ABC. I believe it was 1979. And it was because he had so much confidence in the operators, so much confidence in the guys, Tom Murphy, I believe it was, who was going to acquire ABC, the company was called Capital Cities. And so that's the model we're going after. We're spending a lot of effort getting to know these operators. And then when we are comfortable with them, we're trusting them to pick the market. You know, I don't know anything about Tacoma, Washington, but I've got a friend who does. And so I'm trusting 
that you will make decisions like that as an expert operator. And then I want to invest heavily with you. Got it. That makes sense. Now you, how many deals have you uh, got, uh, have you put capital with? Uh, we've got 36 deals we've done this year that we put capital wow. with this year. That's awesome. And how many operators is that with? Four. That's four, four operators. operators. Yeah. So we got, we, we, we weeded out a whole lot of potential operators. We, we were interested in getting to know some more. So if anybody in your audience fits what you think might be our criteria and you're looking for capital, we'd be interested in chatting with you. I will warn you that we say no about 80 to 90% of the time, but yeah. yeah. That's no, it, it, this is such an interesting perspective. Um, first of all, I think a lot of operators, if they're operating one or two facilities, they're looking to take it to the next level. They're trying to really, maybe they're trying to attract capital like you. What would your suggestion be to an operator that's trying to attract capital, trying to get into more deals so, and trying to really move it up? Because you've talked to a lot of operators and two, you know, really good ones that are doing phenomenal yeah. things in the self-storage industry. What would your advice be to them? My advice to attract capital would be uh, check out the Rockefeller Habits, which is a book. Um, it talks about choke points and it also talks about being a grizzly bear at the waterfall. Now this may sound a little obscure, but this, this literally this two minute story or one minute story changed my life. Um, I was trying to figure out how to get investors and I made a list of all five that I knew. <laughs> <laughs> I had been doing real estate investing since 2000 and largely with a group of friends and family and they were, you know, we were doing really well, but I needed hundreds of potential investors, you know, to, to make what I'm doing now work. And about three years ago, I listened to a podcast from Richard C. Wilson. He told the story, he said, if you're up North um, and you really want to live on salmon, you love salmon, you can become a, a spear fisherman. That means you go out, let's say you're out in the wilds, you go out and learn to whittle, uh, you know, to cut a limb and turn it into a spear. And then you learn, you practice learning to throw the spear. And then you stand by the dark waters and hope that a fish swims by. You hope they don't dodge your spear. You hope that you can pull it successfully into shore and you're going to have a few good meals. But he said, if you really want to get a lot of salmon, become a grizzly bear, I know that's odd, and stand in the middle of a waterfall with your jaw unhinged and let the salmon jump into your mouth. And that was the story that where the light bulb went on for me. And I realized I've got to start creating content. So um, we started a podcast. Uh, I became a guest on what ultimately has been over 120 podcasts in the last uh, three years. Uh, I've written a couple books and I, I had already written the multifamily book by then, but I've, I've, I'm working on a new book. I thought maybe you'd want to be co-author called The Perfecter. <laughs> the More uh, Better. The More Better one, yeah. But, um, <laughs> no, seriously. I, I, and I started writing content for Bigger Pockets. I started blogging. I started doing videos online and now investors come to us almost every day. That's awesome. I, I love that shift in that mentality, um, that idea. You know, it was one of the things that as we've talked over the years, um, we always looked when we were looking at expanding our knowledge in the industry and things, we wanted to get particular sets of skills that maybe other ones didn't have. So we could attract people that were either looking to sell their facility or uh, areas that we could develop. Um, and that's, I mean, that's made us tens of millions. Um, just that idea that we were a voice in the crowd that stood out. And two, some of the stuff we were saying at the time was very different. Um, I remember speaking, um, it must have been five years at a self-storage conference. And I, and I guess apparently I ticked a few people off because I got up and I said, you know, you're all wrong. This isn't a real estate asset. Self-storage is not real estate. It's a business. Um, and that was why we got into it because we believed we could improve the efficiencies of the business and turn around the revenues and in, then the, the asset itself would then increase, increase in, in value. But because of that, we captured multiple deals 
including you know the Rito deals we've talked about as well. Um, so I, I think that is fantastic advice. Um, getting out there, getting on top of the waterfall and leaving your mouth open. So what now you you've been acquiring all these facilities. Talk to us about what you see in the future. Um, you've been placing, what are these operators talking to you about? What are you hearing? Because you have a lot of exposure that many of our listeners, they just don't have. You have it from investors, what they want, what they're seeing, what they're hearing, their pocketbooks, right? But then you have it on the industry, you're on interviews, you're speaking, you're meeting all these people. Um, what's your outlook and plans for the next five years? So we're really concerned, much like you and I talked about, I think it was uh, a year ago this month when we first spoke about, um, you know, overbuilding in the industry, obviously self storage, uh, I don't know if this is a word, but is I would say it's micro local, meaning I could go uh, show you that Nashville is overbuilt for self storage, as was told to me by the top commercial broker in Tennessee. But there are certain areas of Nashville, say in the south side, maybe Bellevue or something, that has vir virtually no self storage. And so we're looking for operators who are very aware of this overbuilding issue and who are looking to acquire, you know, in areas that have barriers to entry or, you know, who are not going to get overbuilt. Uh, we're also wondering if it makes sense to raise some money to be ready for a potential downturn. I mean, we've already heard, AJ, you and I have already heard of some facilities who have gone back to the bank. They didn't get leased up. And so who knows, maybe it, there's going to be an opportunity to do that. I'm still concerned though, even if you could get it at 50 cents on the dollar, would it be in an area it. that's overbuilt in the okay. first place? So, you know, I don't know about that. Um, I'm also wondering, I'm having people ask me, I had an investor ask me a few days ago, what about all these disruptive technologies? You know, this, you know, we come to your home and pick up your stuff and put it in a warehouse and then we deliver it back to you. What do you think of that, AJ? You know, um, a, a lot of people try to dismiss this and um, I, get, I get very concerned when you're in a group of self-storage operators, they dismiss it and they're almost emotional about it, saying this doesn't compete with us, this isn't self-storage. The reason that concerns me is right. they start to sound like taxi drivers. Right. Um, and we believe that a few of these who have gotten hundreds of millions in funding, including yeah. from people like Uber and um, these very, uh, very well-capitalized venture capitalist companies, that are, you know, absolutely bent on completely disrupting and taking, capturing that. Um, they're going all in and they're not holding anything back. And so we don't think it will take all the market. Like we, we don't think it's a, it's a product type like a taxi where it's an all or nothing, but we do believe that a certain share uh, percentage of the market will get captured by it. My question is, is that 10, 20 or 30% of the market? And if you're already in an overbuilt market and clutter, whoever comes to your market and captures another 10% of the market, that, you know, this starts to pile on and add up. Um, and that, that concerns us because we know in the highly dense areas that the economics as prices start rising, old product type on the market. So I, in fact, I've got a product right here. This this one you can kind of see. If you're on the video, we'll post the video. You can go to YouTube and see it that I, I'm pointing at right here. We we purchased this at 140,000 square feet for two million dollars, right? We can charge such low rents that you know it's got to be worth 15 million right now, and it's, it doesn't even matter. So we're not concerned in this area with a clutter moving on the outskirts of the city, buying cheap ground, and being able to come undercut us because they can't compete with us on price in this area. But that's changing. Now, this is where they're getting their game because now as new product type development comes out, prices are rising and this increase in rental rates come up, they can start to actually compete with that. And now I can get valet service at the same price or in some markets cheaper than traditional storage. That's concerning. Um, and so we believe it's gonna creep in and it's gonna come in, but they're not going away. It's not that these people that say that it's not a competitor, 
they're out to lunch. They're putting their head in the sand. So we do believe that other types of competitions like this is coming in and going to be strong. Right. So let me ask you this. Would you know you've been pretty flexible? You're a businessman, not just a real estate guy. Would you be open to investing or developing a, a, a model like that if it made sense? Um, well, I kind of already am. So, <laughs> um, we have invested very heavily in technology that's like a almost a property management system that allows open APIs for us to back end into something like clutter. So how we like to imagine is, let's say you have like self-driving cars, right? That you could literally put your stuff in a self-driving car and it could just tap, attach into our site, show up, and we have a manager walk out, take the stuff and put it into you. Now, the details of how this all worked, you know, this is kind of murky. The point is we wanted an open-end system that would allow our sites to act like clutter if needed, needs to be. Now, this is an interesting thing because this then changes the type of asset you're buying, right? It changes how big it needs to be, all sorts of things, the product type and mix. Another thing that we're doing is we're looking at the product type that we put in. It, we don't like wood framed products because we need to be able to easily adjust size of units. Mm -hmm. um, right. We need to be able to adapt with market. Um, so those are all things that we're doing to try to be able to be ready for these kind of disruptive technology. So not just investing in it, but we're investing in technology that will allow us to pivot with the changes and hopefully be able to not put our heads in the sand and be away from them, but be a part of the change. Makes sense. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we feel the same way and that's what we tell investors. Yeah. <clears throat> and I, I think that at the end of the day, I, I don't think Valet will replace traditional self storage. It, it, I just don't believe that. The reason I don't believe it is because how people use the product type is different. For example, we have businesses that make up a large percentage of this facility, which we actually built for. It was more of a commercial grade type. We built alleyways for semis to come in and they could turn around and flip and they can maneuver. And we have businesses that take up the vast majority of our units are there every single day with cars, things like that. They're using this as a part of their business. That is not something a clutter or anything to replace because we're, it's more of a B2B sell. Another thing that we've done to try to make sure that we're able to absorb uh, that change. But, right. <clears throat> Makes sense. That's a beautiful yeah. facility. Where is that? Uh, so this one is in a suburb of Boise that we got like five years ago. Um, right. And we built this. It's 86,000 square feet um, for 3.2 million. And yep. it's, oh, huge. We, it's one of the nicest facilities, if not the nicest in the entire area. So it's amazing what's changed in four or five years. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, right. No kidding. But so now, aside from that in the future, what um, you're working with investors talking about some of the dangers and things that may, may come, um, are you, what, what does that look like for you in the next, are you reining back? capital or are you saying we're just going forward more cautiously well because we are partnering with operators who are really smart and they know all these issues they've been through the downturn or maybe several downturns in a few cases um, and they're able to acquire really you know cherry pick the very best mom and pop deals we're not raining capital in at all we're, we're feeling really bullish on investing with the right operator in the right deals. And so- um, You're trying to capitalize on the consolidation of the market and saying there's gonna be winners and losers. And as long as we pick the winners, they'll win big. That's right. You, you know, the, the cool thing, and I, and I don't think I ever said this on a podcast till just now, but it just kind of dawned on me why this is such a powerful time in this industry. So think about it, you've got, let's say, 30,000 mom and pop, 20, 20 to 30,000 mom and pop operators who, like I said earlier, don't have the resources, knowledge, or desire to upgrade. You know, they may have, uh, they may not do locks, boxes, tape, and scissors. They may not have a nice showroom. They may not have nice security. They may have two or three or 20 or 30 vacant acres that they could build, you know, that a, a great operator could build a new climate controlled building on. 
There's all kinds of things that can be done. I mean, hey, let's face it, with the value formula for commercial real estate, of course, we know that's value equals the net operating income divided by the cap rate. You can add $5 in admin fees or $5 a month per unit in insurance to an 800 unit building and you've just increased the value of the building, at least on paper, the appraised value by $700,000 just by adding insurance that you profit share in. You know this, AJ. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, the, the mom and pops don't typically do that. Often they don't have websites, et cetera. Now you've got that whole group. Now at the other end of the spectrum, you've got the institutionals who are coming in. They're not finding multifamily just like we aren't. And they're wanting to get into self-storage. So you've got REITs, life insurance companies, pension funds, you know the deal. They're looking for what? They're looking for stabilized deals, institutional quality, franchise-like operations. And so they're looking for everything the mom and pops are not. Well, guess what the perfect strategy is? The strategy, in my mind, is bridging that gap. Being the operator that's willing to acquire at the mom and pop level, upgrade the operations, turn it into an institutional-like deal, put it together in a portfolio with four or 10 other deals, and go into a, an institutional buyer who, by the way, also wants to write much, much larger checks. They don't want to spend $5 million on a deal. They might want to spend 40 or $100 million on a portfolio. It's not now, efficient for them. Perfect. Yeah, it's a perfect business model. And they're willing to pay the institutional typically for the pleasure of getting this larger check size, stability, predictability, and operations. They're willing to pay a premium, so therefore a compressed cap rate. Now, if you can buy at a seven cap and you do nothing with income, and you can sell at a five cap, you just increase the value of the asset, perhaps 30%, but you increase the value of the equity, perhaps 60 to 90%, depending on your leverage. It's powerful just to find the right buyer and the right seller alone. So um, that, okay, what you just described, first of all, not is our business model, except for the fact we don't sell, we recapitalize, reinvest and continue to grow. Um, and this is for me a winning formula. Anyone looking to build, this is how it's done. Even if you start out at one, you get better, you create policies, procedures, you capitalize on another, you start hiring a team, you start uh, allocating capital. Once you get to, in this industry, at just 10 facilities, you're in the top 1% of operators, which is crazy to think about. You know, um, so there's just not a lot of people that own over a million square feet. And uh, it, it's, that is your, the value creation going through that. I, I think people dramatically underestimate what that does to the financials. And I, I don't know if you have enough time. If you don't, we can, we can do this. I'm going to have you on another podcast because I'd like to talk to you about um, when you're, when this value creation part, the financing part, what you look for and how that works. Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. Yeah. So when you come in, you have a mom and pop facility, what are the drivers of revenues? And I know, I know we're kind of doing numbers off the top of our head, things like that. But, you know, what are the expectations that you have of returns and how do you get those returns? Or how do the operators that you invest in, you know that they're gonna, how are they getting those returns? Yeah, so often the, um, and, and stop me if I'm not answering the right question, but often the operators that the mom and pops that are selling are 20 to 30% below market value. And of course that can be fixed and that's a huge increase to the value of the facility. If you can keep the costs constant, you increase the, uh, you know, the rents by 20%, you've dramatically impacted your, not only your bottom line, but of course your value by that about the same amount. Um, some of them don't use credit cards. You know, it's funny, AJ, I don't know what you think, but it seems to me that as a self storage facility, you want to be the top of people's minds until after they rent. And then you want to be forgotten as that, that dings their credit card or their ACH, their bank account every month. Well, mom and pops don't think that way. They said, no, we just take cash and checks. I, I, I talked to a guy, I, I, 
I don't, I still don't know if he was telling the truth, but he, he acquired a facility where the previous operator had the people come in, bring cash and stuff it in their own storage unit. And he would go around and open the units and get their cash <laughs> <laughs> out to get his payments every month. I don't so, know. Sounds like somebody didn't want to pay taxes. I know. It sounds like <laughs> a urban legend too, but. At any rate, so so we're so our operators are looking to fix that. They're looking, of course, to do marketing. They're doing websites. They're making offers. They're adding a showroom with lots, boxes, tape, scissors. Uh, they're charging late fees, possibly admin fees. Uh, they're um, they're of course adding not in all cases, but often adding rental trucks. I mean, let's look at that alone. We just invested in a facility in Grand Junction, Colorado, where they added uh, U-Haul. U-Haul added $3,900 a month to their bottom line with no significant, if any, capital expense. They just had to contract with, you know, sign a contract with U-Haul. You know how it works. Uh, $3,900 a month is about $46,000 a year. Take $46,000 a year. Again, remember our value formula. Value is net operating income divided by cap rate. $46,000 a year by, let's just take their going in cap rate at 7%. That added well over $600,000 to the appraised value. Well, that added about 50% to the equity of this facility, if I remember right, because they use leverage and all that. So that was a significant driver. Well, the mom and pop probably couldn't be bothered or maybe didn't even know they could do U-Haul there. Um, uh, other drivers, of course, would be adding a climate controlled facility to uh, the mix if they had, you know, let's say there was RV or boat parking, which is great, uh, but sometimes it could be more profitable as a three-story climate controlled building on that same half acre. I love that. That's, um, it, it is shocking to us how we can go in and, and I think people underestimate sometimes we have such a different mentality. People are looking for a great stabilized asset that they want to come in. It looks great. And they're like, Oh, I'll, you know, I'll pay a six cap for it. And we're looking, that's the one that I don't want to pay a six cap for yet. I'll go, we'll go to, um, you know, good, great markets. And there's this just kind of a dump of a facility. It's got a lot of square footage. You go in there, somebody's living in it, walks out, and they're like, you know, cash card, what do you want? And I just kind of look at them and I'm like, I want to buy you and I'll pay a five cap. Because the upside that we can get is so astronomical. Right. The cap rate is almost irrelevant to us. Right. We would almost buy it at a zero cap because it just doesn't matter. Between our changes in uh, dynamic pricing was with the rates that we can achieve out of maximizing the revenue and income out of that facility, along with adding 6% in excess sales, um, boxes, products, things like that, plus insurance on top of that, then we can also do some very creative things, um, not just with the, uh, the financing, but offering new product types. Uh, you're, you're increasing the gross revenue of that facility 30, 45%. And what that does to the net, it's just, you know, astronomical. We did that to a facility that we purchased at auction, which we essentially bought it for a three cap. And people were looking at us going, what are you doing? Like we were so out of line. And what, what they didn't realize is we had taken our model, overlaid it. The appraiser came in at 3.9. We overlaid our model, our model at that exact same facility at current market. I'm not talking future hopes and dreams, the current today market, that, uh, that same facility appraised at 8 million. So for us, it wasn't a 3.4 or whatever it was, million dollar facility. It was an $8 million facility. People thought we bought it at a three cap when really we bought it at a 12 cap. And within three months, we were at a higher occupancy and we'd already achieved those numbers, 40 plus percent gross revenue increase. It's the value creation to me is shocking what we can do in self storage. It is. And, and what's cool about it is, you know, you just, let's just round the numbers here and say that you doubled the value of that asset. But depending on how you financed it, you might have just done a 4X on the equity or maybe even 6X on the equity. Or maybe if you paid cash for it and came in, stabilized it, 
and refinanced all the equity out of it, you've got an infinite return from like the fifth month on. That's, oh. that's usually what we do. We are, most of our returns are infinite in our facilities because within a year and a half, all our equity is out and those cash returns then they're plus. I mean, we just pulled all the, you know, our Reno deal, we're a year and a half into it. We've now pulled all our equity out. So we pulled it out plus a million dollars to re-roof and put solar panels on it. And it'll still deliver fabulous cash on cash returns. And I think for people, especially beginning, don't look for the best product. Look for the most upside in the market. That's, that's what I would tell people people yeah, I um, agree. and don't go to compete with reads and things on their product type because that's, that's not where you can compete so before here i know you got to run i want to kind of close it off though what would you tell today get if someone that's looking to get in and a current operator where are the opportunities uh, where are the opportunities that you see in the market wherever that may be i ask this to people and some will say geographic locations other things where are the opportunities that you're seeing and uh, over the next three years, and what should, where are the opportunities and where are the downsides? Where should people be looking at? What, what yeah, should they be well, looking for? Well, I mean, I think somebody should, everybody should really be careful <clears throat> in, of course, checking the market, the demographics, some of the numbers we talked about earlier. You and I have talked earlier about seeing a brand new product go in right down the street from another one that's just starting lease up. And it's going to cause problems for everybody. So, of course, we want to avoid those. As far as opportunities, AJ, I would just say what I've already, the drum I've already been beating, which is buy uh, mom and poorly run, mismanaged mom and pop facilities in the path of growth. And to do that, um, you know, I, I, I think the best way to do that is just, to, you know, get a list and start calling them, emailing them, writing them letters, dropping in. I talked to a guy yesterday from Colorado and, you know, uh, he said, there is a deal here for like, I think it was three or $4 million. He ran, he did the overlay like you did and said, you know, it's so poorly run. It could be an $8 million facility if just run right, you know, right. Well, that guy, you know, he's got a, a tiger by the tail here if he can pull this one down. But, you know, I don't know if he can, he doesn't have any experience in self storage. So he's looking to partner with somebody if somebody wants to reach out. I can try give him my phone number. I'd yeah, be happy. Right. <laughs> no, I, I really will. Yeah, that'd be great. Now, okay, a lot of these people listening here, they may be trying to get in, they don't feel that they can, and they're looking to maybe partner up with somebody like you. Where can people find you? Where can people reach out from you? And to uh, tell them resources that they can go online, because there's, you have so much knowledge, not, and we, we didn't even really touch on this, in real estate, and what you've done, not only in apartment buildings, but what you're doing in self-storage, as well as your past, you're an entrepreneur, you've done so much. Where can people find you, get a hold of you, and learn more from you? Yeah, so we've got a podcast that I think you are a guest on called How to Lose Money, howtolosemoney.com. <laughs> I'm also all, all over bigger pockets, but the best way to reach out to me is at my website, wellingscapital.com. That's W-E-L-L-I-N-G-S capital.com and we'll put that in the show notes too for everybody so they can uh, reach out but paul absolutely thank you so much for coming on i listeners don't worry i will have paul on again i'm going to hold him to it i'm going to make him come on here because he just provides so much value when he does we really do appreciate it thank you so much thanks aj it's been a real honor